It was the era of rock and roll and drive-ins, sock hops and poodle skirts, the 1950s. But with the end of a war, new challenges appeared. Racial tensions surfaced across the nation, even as soldiers returned home. In America, ignorance was easier than acknowledgement. Women were considered insignificant, along with American minorities. American Indians encountered negative stereotypes, abuse, and discrimination. Murders were easily covered up, the government took back native land, and freedom of the press was not widely practiced on the reservations. Something needed to be done. These conditions fueled the beginning of a movement that would affect generations of activists seeking the same rights as others more privileged. As more and more issues appeared, the people needed a voice. Formed in 1968, the American Indian Movement, or AIM, initiated a conversation that united a disjointed population. It began as a program to help American Indian prisoners, but it grew to support and spur protests of all kinds across the nation. These included taking over Alcatraz in 1969 and Wounded Knee in 1973. One woman chronicled these acts and wrote articles that revealed the reality on the reservation. Minnie Chishu's, a dedicated activist, fought for her beliefs and demanded justice through her pointed and often witty journalistic writing. She advocated when others were afraid and drew attention to offenses and bias within both the American government and organizations claiming to fight for equality. Racism and sexism were prevalent in the 1950s and 60s when Chishu's grew up. Women were often portrayed as weak and reliant on men, and American Indians were rarely represented in the media. In her weekly newspaper called In Red Road Home, Tushu's observed that the TV star Richard Boone was an oddity because he appeared to have a darker skin tone, something that was rarely seen during the period. Tushu's grew up as a member of the Assiniboine tribe on the Fort Peck Reservation in Montana. When her parents separated, she was placed in the Bureau of Indian Affairs Relocation Program. As a result, she switched schools frequently, where she was harassed about her name, race, and short stature. She later returned to the reservation as a mother of five. She often wrote about her children, and she perhaps saw these same injustices reflected on their faces. These hardships fueled her need to stand up through writing about racial inequality and aligning herself with activist organizations such as the American Indian Movement. During her time as an AIM member, Tujus took part in many AIM activities, rivaling the opinions held by white citizens. In Red Road Home, Earning an AIM, Tujus explains her part. By the time I was in my late teens, I was involved in Native activism and the struggles of the 70s, taking part in many occupations, takeovers, and protests for Native rights. I traveled thousands of miles for a protest march. On the way, I'd hit a power or two, and I became well known for my hitchhiking ability. Two Shoes never let lack of transportation stop her from attending protests, and her hitchhiking skills are often mentioned. Rest in Peace Minnie Two Shoes, a tribute on the only on Fort Peck newspaper, explains her moniker. Minnie got the name Two Shoes when she started hitchhiking across the country to American Indian movement events. She got around on her Two Shoes. While she did not let distance stop her in her attempts to make a difference for Native people, she faced a second problem, discrimination inside the American Indian movement. AIM's motto was anywhere, anytime, any place, meaning that they would always stand for justice and confront any inequalities. Tushis firmly believed in these goals. However, she did not always support AIM as a whole, as she found that the group and its leaders refused to acknowledge the injustice within the group itself. The clear patriarchy prevented any women from taking on a leadership role. Because of the discrimination within AIM, Tushis protested the sexism and confronted the leaders, proving that she truly valued justice. She wouldn't be swayed by the opinions of others or blindly follow any group, even if she shared many of the same ideas. She openly shared her own opinions, which was very risky at the time, especially with an aim where women were often expected to step down and let the men take control. Her open protest against AIM leaders ultimately caused her expulsion from the group. After she was forced to leave AIM, Tushus investigated the murder of a friend and fellow female AIM member, Anna Mae Pictou Aquash. Laura Ferguson writes about the investigation in Minnie Tushu's American Indian Journalist. In an attempt to sabotage AIM, the FBI planted informants in the organization, fracturing the trust between its members. In early 1975, 
AIM leaders questioned Two Shoes about providing information to the FBI and exiled her, despite her claims of innocence. That summer, two male AIM leaders interrogated Two Shoes' friend, Anna May Akwash, at gunpoint. Akwash was murdered six months later. When Akwash, who led extensive community building and educational efforts, was killed in late 1975, the FBI claimed she died of exposure. A second autopsy revealed that she had been shot in the head. Paul Domaine, a friend of Tushu's and editor at News from Indian Country, was also part of the investigation. He recalled Tushu's commitment to the case in a 2016 phone interview. We went to Washington, D.C. and reviewed files. We went to the Minnesota Historical Society and reviewed tons of documents, 77,000 files in Washington, D.C., and a couple hundred thousand files in Minnesota. Tushu's excellent memory was a useful asset when investigating the murder. Tushu's could remember specific dates or places, which provided beneficial evidence. There was times when she would uh, say, oh no, you know, I know Anna May uh, rode to the American Indian Movement National Convention in New Mexico in 1975 with Iris Thundercloud. Then we would find out what Anna May Pictuakwash had said to her after she was interrogated by Peltier, you know, Butler and Bob Rubidoux at that uh, National AIM convention in New Mexico in 1975. Domaine remembers Tushu's humor and how it allowed her to connect with people emotionally. Domaine and Tushu's were going into the Federal Bureau of Investigation building when she put down a tape recorder. Security was concerned about its potential to carry explosives. So everyone rushed down there and uh, checked it out, and the tape recorder was safe. And so that she got to clear a light to go into the FBI, and she reaches up to her glasses there and pulls out this huge stick pin. And she pulls it out and holds it right up in front of one of the security guards and says, Oh, is this illegal? And the guy jumps back and looks at it and he says, I don't think so. And that stands out in my mind totally as being an epic mini two-shoes moment. The extensive efforts of two-shoes and her colleagues were finally recognized when arrests were made, but of the 20 people involved in the murder, only four were charged. Two-shoes and the others drew attention to murders, rapes, and other abuse within AIM itself. She unveiled the hypocrisy and the arrests associated with the murder of Anna Mae Aquash are still some of the most controversial American Indian movement arrests today. Because of her expulsion from AIM, Tushu's turned towards journalism and education within the Native American Journalists Association, or NAJA. Tushu's chronicled injustice and took a stand on many issues throughout her life. However, her commitment to the organization intensified after the Aquash case. Formed in 1983, the Native American Journalists Association brought American Indian journalists together to confront problems such as absence of support from tribal leaders. As a founder of the organization, Tushu's actively took part in conferences and other gatherings until her death in 2010. Tushu's was able to inspire a new generation of journalists by teaching them techniques of storytelling that conveyed a deeper message. Author and instructor at University of Montana Helena, Laura Ferguson explains Tushu's role in inspiring young journalists. Many work often as a mentor to teach young people, college students, about journalism, to get them interested in journalism. She mentored them and took them into the field so that they could get some actual experience. And she taught them in a way that she, you know, she brought her humor into that. She told them it's okay to tell a serious story in a, in a way that the humor is there because humor humanizes people. Tushu's used her writing to tell a story that too often went untold. The story of the women within AIM who couldn't speak out. The story of American Indians that were denied basic rights, such as quality health care and freedom of the press. The story of a movement of the people who fought for justice and those who died defending it. Tushu's needed to write. She needed to make a difference and give to future generations so that others didn't have to suffer. She had all odds stacked against her, being both a woman and an American Indian but she did not let either define her. She rose above the criticism and let her actions and words speak louder than the prejudice and hatred surrounding her. She spoke a truth that most were afraid to tell. Many Tushus truly cared. Many Tushus never backed down. Many Tushus was the voice of the voiceless. As journalists, we're very special people. 
and uh, we have a very serious responsibility. But that doesn't mean we can't have fun along the way. 